Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So I was thinking what I might say tonight, especially given that it's uh, the first presidential debate um, or whatever you call it, bread and circus in Rome. Um, and I want to talk about tending ourselves and tending the world. And we'll see if it's helpful or useful or makes sense to you. i start with a story from the British writer Bernard Hare, um, this happened a couple decades ago. He was then a young student living on very little money in, in London. Um, uh, the police called at my student hovel in the early evening, but I didn't answer as I thought they'd come to evict me. I hadn't play, paid my rent in a couple of months. But then I got to thinking my mom hadn't been too good and what if it was something about her? We had no phone in the hovel and mobiles hadn't been invented yet, so I had to nip down the phone box rang home to Leeds to find my mother was in the hospital and not expected to survive the night. Get home, son, my father said. I got to the railway station to find I'd missed the last train. A train was going as far as Peterborough, but I would miss the connecting Leeds train by 20 minutes. I bought a ticket and got on. I was a struggling student, didn't have the money for a taxi the whole way, but I had a screwdriver in my pocket and a bunch of skeleton keys. I was so desperate to get back to my mom, I planned to nick a car in Peterborough or hitchhike or steal some money or something. I knew from my dad's voice that she might die. Tickets, please, I heard, fumbled for my ticket, gave it to the guard. He stamped it and stood there looking at me. I'd been crying, had red eyes. You okay, he said. Of course I'm okay. Why wouldn't I be? What's it got to do with you in any case? You look awful, he said. Anything I can do? You could get lost, mind your own business, I said. That'd be a big help. I wasn't in the mood for talking. He was only a little bloke. He must have read the danger signal in my body language and tone of voice, but he sat down anyway. If there's a problem, I'm here to help. That's what I'm paid for. I was a big bloke in my prime, so I thought for a second about physically sending him on his way, but it somehow didn't seem right. He wasn't really doing much wrong. And I was going through all the stages of grief at once, denial, anger, guilt, withdrawal, fear, everything but acceptance. I was a cauldron of emotion, and he was in my line of fire. The only thing I could think of to get rid of him was to tell my story. Look, my mom's in the hospital dying. She won't survive the night. I'm going to miss the connection to Leeds at Peterborough. I'm not sure how I'm even going to get home. It's tonight or never. I won't get another chance, so I'm a bit upset. Don't feel like talking, okay? Be grateful if you leave me alone. Okay, he said. Sorry to hear, son. I'll leave you alone then. Hope you make it home in time. Wandered down the carriage, taking tickets. I looked out the window. Ten minutes later, he was back by the side of my table. Oh, no, I thought. Here we go again. He touched my arm. Listen, when we get to Peterborough, shoot straight over to Platform 1 as quick as you like. The Leeds train will be there. I looked at him. Confused. Come again, I said. What do you mean? Is it late or something? He said, no, it isn't late. I just ra- radioed Peterborough. They're going to hold the train for you. As soon as you get on, it goes. Everyone will be complaining about how late it is, but let's not worry about that. You get home, and that's the main thing. Good luck and God bless. And then he was off down the train taking tickets. Tickets, please. More tickets. And I suddenly realized what a top-class, full-fledged ass I was. Some of us have had that experience in our own lives. And chased him down the train, and I wanted to give him all the money from my wallet, my driver's license, my keys, name my firstborn child, but I knew he'd be offended. I caught up and grabbed his own. I just wanted, he said, it's okay. He had a warm smile and real compassion in his eyes. He was a good man for its own sake. I wish I had some way to thank you. Not a problem, he said. If you need to thank me, The next time you see someone in trouble, you help them out. That will pay me back amply. Tell them to pay you back the same way, and soon the world will be a better place. I was at my mother's side when she died in the early hours of the morning. Even now, I can't think of her without remembering the conductor on that late-night train 
and to this day I won't hear a bad word said about British Rail. <laughs> My meeting with the conductor changed me from a selfish, potentially violent hedonist into a decent human being, but it did take a little time. I've paid him back a thousand times since then. I tell the younger people that I now work with in juvenile hall and so forth. And I'll keep on doing it till the day I die. You don't owe me nothing, I say to these young people. And if you think you do, I'll give you the same advice the conductor gave me. Just pass it down the line. So uh, an opening story about a personal moment of kindness and connection. And of course it is personal, but it's more than personal. Um, yesterday I met a couple of people who had just flown back from the celebration and the opening of the new African American Museum in Washington, D.C., which from all accounts that I've read is absolutely magnificent. And they were standing there telling me about it. They'd been involved in the building and support for it. Um, and they were weeping as they talked. And they said it is filled with such amazing art and literature and the sense of beloved community and also the artifacts of tragedy and pain. Emmett Till's coffin and, you know, Ku Klux Klan outfits that have blood on them and, you know, pictures of lynchings and um, all those kind of things. But also uplift and magnificence of the art and the literature and the things that were created in pride. Um, and I thought about the story of one of my favorite reads of these last decades, which is a book called Bury the Chains by Adam Hochschild, in which he describes a group of a dozen folks who met in a tea shop or printer shop in England in the 18, sorry, in the 1780s and 90s, when slavery was still the major economic engine of the British Empire. That and sugar in, in the Caribbean and Latin America, and sugar was the oil of the time and that was where all the money was coming from. And they met, it was, some of them were Quakers, some weren't, and the head of this was a man named Thomas Clarkson who ended up riding on horseback 30,000 miles around England bringing some ex-slaves who were well-spoken and articulate about the terrors of the Middle Passage and what slavery actually was like into the living rooms of English people around the country. And after 30 years, this small group of people, which grew into a movement, um, were able to effect in the British Parliament the law that outlawed slavery in the British Empire, starting with 12 people. Um, and the the Quakers who worked a lot with Thomas Clarkson, they wouldn't take their hats off for the king. We only take our hats off for God. But when Thomas Clarkson died, all the Quakers in England took their hats off. So there is the momentary tending of another person on a train, of someone in trouble, and there's the tending of the injustice and the the justice that's needed in the world. Um, and you might have hoped you were coming here tonight to escape from politics. <laughs> Poet and, uh, has written a charm for you called A Charm Against the Language of Politics. After you've compared the candidates' slippery platforms, say over and over the names of things, the clean nouns, weeping birch, Tanager, Damask Rose. Read field guides, atlases, gravestones. At the store, bless each apple by kind. Macintosh, wine sap, delicious, Jonathan. Enunciate the vegetables and herbs. Okra, cilantro, calendula. After a speech on compromising the environment, recite the tough, silky structure of webs. Tropical stick, ladder web, mesh web, filmy dome, funnel web. Chant the spiders, comb-footed, round-headed, garden cross, feather-legged, black-faced. Remember that most short verbs are ethical. Hatch, grow, spin, trap, eat. Dig deep, pronounce clearly, pull the words in over your head, 
and hole up until it's time to hatch. <laughs> but you really can't escape politics any more than you can escape death or taxes. Uh, you'll see. <laughs> it's coming. Um, because underneath, in human incarnation, there is suffering. And there's also our care for one another, that they're both true. So when we look at the political world, there's so many lenses we can use it. One of them is it's a way to tend to people's fears and desires and suffering. How do we tend to our suffering? This from a book I just got called I Wish My Teacher Knew. It has little, you know, handwritten letters, mostly by second and third graders. I wish my teacher knew that I don't have pencils at home to do my homework. I wish my teacher knew that my mom doesn't sign my reading log because she can't read. I wish my teacher knew that after my mom got diagnosed with cancer, I've been without a home three different times this year. I wish my teacher knew that my dad works two jobs and I don't see him much. I wish my teacher knew that I get worried um, I'm, oh, that, my little, my, that my little brother gets scared and I get worried when he wakes me up every night. I wish my teacher knew that I love animals and I would do anything for my animals. I would love to work at the SPCA so I could help animals get adopted. I wish my teacher knew that I'm smarter than she thinks. <laughs> and you hear the spirit of these little kids. And you also know, I remember teaching this education conference that, yes, it's great to teach STEM, you know, science and technology and, you know, math and all of those kinds of things, um, engineering and math. But you can't learn math when your parents are in the middle of a terrible divorce and when there isn't money to pay the rent, you know, or when you're worried about the health of somebody in your family and there are no resources. Um, and so part of what politics um, speaks to is really what we have to tend to as human beings. The suffering that each person carries, no one in this room is exempt from it, and the care that's there in our hearts. Because you hear those stories and you think about that kid, you think about the teachers in that child's classroom, and I get to take a breath when it stops working. Nice. Ah. And what it means not just to see the um, papers that are submitted, but also somehow to see both the tears and the, and the tender heart and the possibility in that human being. Now, mostly politics is driven by fear. Um, so that H.L. Mencken, who was a great political commentator, said the whole aim of politics is to create a continual state of alarm. This was a hundred years ago he said this. To frighten and menace the populace with an endless series of hobgoblins, almost all unreal, as a way to gain power. So that's one assessment of politics. Another way to understand it is that politics is ritualized warfare. That in the old days, the Republicans and the Democrats, and maybe the Libertarians or Greens would chime in with smaller armies, would get in their tanks or get on their horses and, you know, bring, pull their knights out and see who gets the power and who gets to run the country. That's how it worked for a very long time among human beings. Even though it is um, painful to watch at times our political system and in certain ways still quite problematic, at least it's done in a political way as a ritual kind of warfare. It is a warfare, and you can see people, you know, approaching it as a battle, but it's not literally enacted. So that doesn't, then when you see what happens and how messy it is, it's not so surprising. Because that's, it's become our way of um, both solving the question of who gets the power, who makes the decisions for us 
in government. Um, and there's a lot of conflict in it. Now, the sad thing is that because of what Manson said, often politics is driven by fear. Um, and we end up forging bonds of hatred rather than bonds of love. James Baldwin, who writes, I believe one of the reasons that people cling to their hate and prejudice so stubbornly is they sense that once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with their own pain. And so we project our pain or our fear or our insecurity because we are insecure. Anybody in this room not insecure? Come on. I mean, as Rilke, the poet, said, ultimately it's upon our vulnerability that we depend. Because we're vulnerable to the people who are driving the other way on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard and somebody could just turn their wheel and crash into us in a moment. We're vulnerable to the air that we breathe in the Fukushima nuclear reactor and how much particles of cesium or whatever are in our air or water. We're vulnerable to one another. And human life is tender and vulnerable as well as being robust. But this is a reality for us. And so instead of understanding that the human lot is also insecure, security is a superstition, um, we project it on the communists. They're, you're gonna, they're our enemy. The enemy du jour or you know, the Mexicans or the immigrants or the gays or the, or the Muslims or whatever, the Yemeni du jour. You, they're the ones we have to be afraid of, you know, and if they weren't there, then everything would be hunky-dory. Um, and that kind of whipping up of fear um, as a way to solve our problems doesn't lead to much happiness for us. But it turns out that there are other ways to meet insecurity, which is partly why we meditate. From Martin Luther King where he says, now there's a final reason that I say love your enemies. It's this, that love has within it a redemptive power. And there's a power there that eventually transforms individuals, just keep loving them and they can't stand it too long Oh, they'll react in many ways in the beginning. They'll react with guilt feelings and sometimes they'll just hate you more at that time. But you just keep loving them and by the power of your love, they will break down under the load. <laughs> That's love, you see. It's redemptive. There's something about love that builds up and is creative and there's something about hate that tears down and is destructive. So when I was at the first... Buddhist White House leadership gathering last year and gave a teaching um, kind of to sum up what we were doing. There were all these beautiful um, wise teachings that the Buddha had given to kings and ministers of his age um, where he said, if you want to have a wise society, a healthy society, then you answer these questions. Do the members of that community meet regularly in harmony, discuss things in harmony and depart in harmony? If so, they will prosper and not decline. Do they follow and honor the wisdom of past elders? They will prosper and not decline if they do. Do they tend and care for the natural world around them, the environment? Do they care for women and children and the most vulnerable among them? When they meet, do they treat all community members with respect and dignity? If so, they will prosper and not decline. And do they cultivate their own personal mindfulness and loving kindness so then they can ex be expected to prosper and not decline? So these are ancient teachings and you hear them and they resonate, they're beautiful. But here's the interesting part. They're not really a big surprise. We kind of know this, right? But what I was able to say after talking about this and lots of other things at the White House is that these are not just ideals. The best news is that there are ways to develop them for human beings. And all the 
10,000 studies and papers in modern neuroscience in the last couple of decades in compassion practice and mindfulness training and so forth show that through the power of our attention, through the cultivation of compassion in a systematic way, of forgiveness, of loving kindness, mindfulness of body and emotions and so forth, whether it's in little kids or grown-ups, whether it's in um, medical settings or business or in education, that these trainings rewire us and they show us, they, they actually give us the tools to learn how to be in the presence of conflict and difficulty and fear in a centered and kind way. So the beautiful news is not just that these are great ideals, which they are kind of universal across wise cultures, but that you as a human being have the capacity to grow and develop in these just as surely as you could plant a seed in a garden and water it and tend it and let the sunlight and all the you know nourishment of, of that, um, whatever, whatever you put to amend the soil, and beautiful things will grow. And it turns out to be true for the human heart. Now, what does the Dharma, the teachings traditionally of Buddhist psychology and the kind of practices that we do, actually have to contribute to all of this? Well, first of all, underlying it is the, is the deep wisdom that what we need in the world, especially at this time, is not more technological advance, although that's marvelous. Nanotechnology, biotechnology, greater computers, world wide web space technology, all that, very cool, astonishing, actually, astonishing. But we are, as one of the chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, a nation of nuclear giants and ethical infants. And so the outer development of humanity now has to be matched by inner development, by the development of understanding of interdependence and the development of, of a capacity to attend and listen and development of compassion and all of these things. The meaning of the word dharma, which means truth, it means the teachings, it has a lot of meanings, my teacher, Ajahn Chah, said dharma means the heart. That was his translation. And it means that when we approach the world through the dharma heart, we live instead of with fear, we live with trust. It doesn't mean that fear doesn't arise, it does. But that there's a deeper sense of trust. As Nelson Mandela said, coming out of 27 years in Robben Island prison, it never hurts to see the good in someone they often act the better because of it. And Mother Teresa's words were, if we have no peace, it is because we've forgotten that we belong to each other, that we're family. So the first thing that the Dharma teaches us is how to quiet the mind and open the heart and begin to listen more deeply to connect with ourselves, to connect with our deepest values, and to connect with one another. And without something like this, we can flail around like a boat without a rudder. Everything that comes that's good and everything that's bad kind of knocks us around each day. But as you learn to practice, and as you undertake this training of presence and centeredness of loving awareness, as the Tao asks, in the Tao Te Ching, do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving until the right action arises by itself? Patient with both friends and enemies, you accord with the way things are, compassion in action and thought, you reconcile with all beings. And so there's something that's offered to us in these practices and in the contemplative dimension of humanity all across the world, so many traditions, that remind us that there's a different way to live. 
And when Mahatma Gandhi took one week, excuse me, took one day a week in silence, in the middle of deconstructing the entire British Empire, um, and you know, there's these huge demonstrations and marches with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in India and battles and all this, and Gandhiji would say, well, Thursday's my day off, you know, I have to be quiet that day. And they'd say, but we need you. And he'd say, you may need me, but I need to listen to something deeper and bigger. And he would get quiet for that day every week and listen like a Sabbath that we all need to what he could do that was the purest and the most genuinely helpful and the most honorable with his life. And what a beautiful set of questions to, to ask ourselves. In the Dhammapada, the verses, ancient verses from the Buddha's time, meditate, live purely, be quiet, do your work with mastery. Like the moon, come out from behind the clouds. The one who awakens shines with the radiance of spirit. Come out and shine like the moon, but first quiet yourself, quiet the mind, tend the heart, come back to yourself and let what is beautiful in you, what is beautiful in each one of you, have space to be heard and listened to and blossom and grow. Because who you are in the end is spirit, you know, Consciousness, there's all kinds of words for it, loving awareness. I mean, how did you get into that human body? You didn't even remember very well, did you? Your parents did something, but whatever, right? They did a lot of things, but that one made you. Um, Who you are is the spirit that was born into this body. And that's what will leave the body when you die as well. If you're not the, you know, you think you're the, like, kale, and um, pasta that you eat. I mean, that's just not who you are, right? Vegetables and, you know, yogurt. All right, well, then maybe I'm my feelings and thoughts. I hope not, really. Come on, they change. You, You feel one thing and 15 seconds later you feel something else. They're beautiful things, but they're not who you are. You are the witness to this. You are the consciousness that was born into this body. Who you are is loving awareness itself. And when my teacher went to talk to his great master, you know, 50 years more than that ago, and said, I've had all these great meditation experiences and so forth. He found this great master. Master said, oh, you missed the point. Those are just like movies on the screen. The only question is, who's having those experiences? Who are you really? Turn your attention back and become... The one who knows was his expression, the witness to it all. Rest in loving awareness. And then you'll see joy and sorrow and pleasure and pain and gain and loss and, you know, fame and disrepute, praise and blame. Anybody not have those? They keep changing. But there is a a space of knowing that is always present and available that can allow for and contain and hold all things with a tender heart, with compassion and love and awareness together. So I got a new book that just came out a couple of days ago and friends of mine helped create it, called The Book of Joy. The Book of Joy is a week-long dialogue between the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu. They're, they're old buddies, right? And the principal uh, question in the book is, How can you two, who have suffered so much, two two under the apartheid regime and the kinds of suffering in South Africa that were enormous and the deaths, and the Dalai Lama and the destruction of Tibetan culture and all of those things and being in exile for more than 50 years, how can you two laugh? How can you two be joyful? You know, what do you have to teach us about this? And as you read it, you know, you just feel their, their spirit. I mean, I, I say very often, I think people go to hear the Dalai Lama not for all those great teachings that he does, those fantastic Tibetan teachings that no one quite understands, but they seem really cool, right? Um, 
or even the fact that he's this peace Nobel laureate, political wise figure and so forth. People go to hear him laugh, that he can sit up there after all that he's been through and giggle and laugh, this deep belly laugh, and love life. So they're talking, you know, and he says, he, they're talking about their age, you know, they're both in their 80s. Yeah, I went to see a German specialist for my knee, the Dalai Lama said, knees. He found my physical condition pretty good, but then he told me my knees were the problem. He said, you're not 18 years old anymore, you're 80 years old, so nothing much can be done. I felt that was really a great teaching. It's very important to think about impermanence. He reminded me I'm 80 years old. That's wonderful. But my friend, you're even older than me. Are you showing off, the archbishop says. Oh, yeah, he says. He goes on. He said, um, are you showing off for me in this visit? Something else happened. And, and um, uh, the media at the airports, you know, said this was a special occasion. And they said, you must be very happy to have Archbishop Tutu visiting, the Dalai Lama went on. I told them, yes, indeed, I'm happy. I'm very happy. I'm receiving one of my very good friends. Firstly, on the human level, he's a very good human being. Secondly, he's a religious leader, a serious practitioner who respects different religious traditions. And then thirdly, and most important, he's my very, very close friend. You are flattering me, said Tutu. So then I told them that you often used to describe me as a mischievous person. So I said, I also consider you a mischievous person. And the meeting of two mischievous persons is wonderful. So happy reunion for us and happy birthday. And they laughed. Thank you very much, the archbishop said. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for this great lunch. And thank you for putting out all those people along the road to welcome us. <laughs> So you just get the spirit of these two world figures having a good time with one another and how happy it makes you. So what the Dharma has to offer first is a reminder of who we are. And this leads into a kind of equanimity. It offers equanimity. You know the Ojibwa saying that's so now many times spoken Sometimes I go about pitying myself when all the while I'm being carried by great winds across the sky. There is a reality that is vast that we are a part of, and we can tune in to this mystery and this vastness. And we know it, again, when we sit quietly, or we take a walk in the hills, or we walk by the ocean, or watch the that harvest moon that rose last week and in this amazing way, or we sit with someone giving birth, give birth ourselves, or sit with someone who's dying, or make love, which a wonderful, a mysterious, wild thing to do, actually. Kind of strange, isn't it? <laughs> but cool. Yes, we like it. And it's just, you know, these bodies are really weird, but wonderful at the same time. Or, you know, we listen to an amazing piece of music and all of a sudden we remember that we're connected with something so vast. And we also sense the ephemeralness of it all, the emptiness of it, which is mysterious. I drove by the house that I had lived in Woodacre for almost 30 years that we sold a couple of years ago. Um, and um, I looked at it, there's a new younger family in it. You know, my daughter's 32 now and married and off working as a, a lawyer doing asylum and human rights law and things like that. But I looked at it and they'd repainted things and I thought about all the things that had happened. We got this little bungalow and we put on all kinds of other parts, a new floor and all these gardens and the people who'd come over and the adventures we'd had. No one remembers it, it's all gone, except for me and I'm just barely remembering it, right? It was there and my daughter a little bit, but that's it. And my ex, it's gone. It's empty. This whole life and all that seems so real. And then what happens to it? It disappears and vanishes into emptiness because everything does look, it's back there with the dinosaurs and the pharaohs and, you know, Y2K, remember that? I mean, <laughs> things appear and then they, you know, they vanish. And having a vast vision is such a beautiful thing. Because in the vast vision, 
you can see the turning of the seasons and the, the turning of the magic of the spheres of the earth, of, you know, making its way around the sun. Now we just came through the, you know, turning of the seasons in the last day of summer and the equinox. And it makes things become, they're ephemeral, but they actually become more precious. What is life, says the crowfoot elder? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It's the breath of a buffalo in winter time. It's the little shadow that runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. And things appear and they're very tender and we love them and then they change. And to have equanimity means that we can see the seasons of change. Civilizations come and go, political parties come and go. Sometimes there's a lot of suffering in it, which is very sad and we have to tend to it and try to prevent it. But we can't really prevent change and we can't really prevent the changing of cycles of how human beings act. But we can take our seat somehow in the midst of it all, in all of the turning of the world and remember our place in it so that we can plant beautiful seeds wherever we are. Now John Muir, who was, you know, the one of the greatest naturalists ever in the kind of in the Western Western world, um, perhaps not counting the native naturalists who were, you know, many, many. But John Muir, who convinced Teddy Roosevelt to start the national park system and make Yosemite the first park and all those good things. One of the things John Muir used to do, and there's a fantastic description of it, was to go out in the in this middle of a storm. You know, we tend to, big storms coming, we tend to batten down the hatches. He said, um, on a particular day, one of the most beautiful and exhilarating storms I ever enjoyed in, the, in, in, enjoyed in the Sierras occurred in December 1874 when I was exploring one of the tributaries to the Uber, Uber River. The day was pure and balmy, but a bracing wind began, and I lost no time pushing out into the woods to enjoy it, for the danger to life and limb is hardly greater than one experiences crouching deprecatingly beneath a roof. I took a long, tingling scramble through the copses and ceanothus and gained the summit of the highest ridge in the neighborhood. And then it occurred to me it would be a fine thing to climb one of the trees to obtain a wider outlook and get my ear close to the aeolian music at its topmost needles. I made a choice of the tallest of a group of Douglas spruces, ponderosa, that were growing, growing close together like a tuft of grass. Though comparatively young, they were a hundred feet high and their lithe, brushy tops were rocking and swirling in ecstasy. Wild. Being accustomed to climb trees and making botanical studies, I had no difficulty reaching the top, but never before did I enjoy such a noble exhilaration of motion. The tops flapped fairly in the wind as I lashed myself, and the widest sweeps in my treetop described an arc from 20 to 30 degrees. I felt sure of its elastic temper, This was like a great wave of grain, these huge trees in the wind. And my eye rolled over the valleys, ridge to ridge, shining foliage. And the sounds of the storms, this exuberance, the base of the naked branches and the bowls booming like like waterfalls and the tingly vibrations of the pine needles. And I kept my lofty perch for hours, closing my eyes to enjoy the music of life itself. So whenever you're having a hard sitting in meditation (laughs) or you're in the midst of one of those no good, terribly bad, difficult days, think of John Muir and say, all right, I'm going to lash myself to the top in the middle of this huge storm and feel the movement of the seasons, the tears that come through you, the grief that comes, the loss, the anger, the fear, the, the longing, the love, the joy, all the things that make you human. And remember that underneath that, there is a possibility of equanimity, of balance in the midst of it all. And that's really part of the, what the 
the training of the Dharma gives you. Because otherwise, with climate change, which is right there in our, you know, midst, or our concerns about the election or the Supreme Court or whatever, we can get lost in a kind of reactivity. Doesn't mean you don't work for what you care about. But um, when Wes Nisker, good friend and colleague here, went to talk to Gary Snyder a couple years ago, Gary was 84 at the time, and this renowned environmentalist for the last half a century, Earth Household Pulitzer Prize, and he said, Gary, climate change, the oceans are rising, species are being lost, um, all kinds of disruption happening. Um, what do you say to us as an environmentalist and uh, for all these decades? And he looked back and he said, don't feel guilty. If you're going to save it, don't save it out of guilt or anger because those are the very things that cause the problems. If you're going to save it, save it because you love it. Save it because it's you. It's part of you. It is your heritage. It's your, it's your body of the earth. And so with equanimity, it's not that you can't act, but you have a sense of the storms coming and going, political, climate, whatever, and you find that vastness around it that says, I can rest in, in, in a peaceful heart and I can tend this from a place of understanding rather than a place of fear. Because politics is trying to make you afraid and you don't have to go down that road. What's also true is that equanimity has to include suffering. Dina Metzger, friend and poet and activist, writes, Give me everything mangled and bruised, and I will make a light of it to make you weep, and we will have rain, and we will begin again. Because even though there is suffering, it turns out that suffering isn't the end of the story. That it's only one part of the story, just as the seasons turn. And so here's the Dalai Lama and Tutu together. And there's some point in which, see if I can find the right page. Um, Tutu says, how come you're not morose? How come you're not a sourpuss with all that's happened to you? The Dalai Lama had never heard the word sourpuss before. <laughs> They'd had a couple of con t conflicts as they were talking about different ideas about God, and they're very, you know, highly developed intellect, and they were arguing about it in a very kind of friendly way. And then at some point, um, with all the, you know, happening there, the Dalai Lama pretended to reach over and choke Archbishop Tutu with his hands. <laughs> And Archbishop turned back to him and said, hey, the cameras are on us. We have to act like holy men. Come on. <laughs> you know? So there's, there's something in, in this um, in which uh, he goes on to say, you know, don't be a sourpuss. And they've kind of figured out. There's something in this of equanimity that says it, you don't contribute to the world through your fear, through your depression, through your um, anxiety. You actually contribute to the world by bringing your steadiness and your love and your good heart. The other thing that makes equanimity and that the Dharma contributes is laughter. It's called the laughter of the wise. And I remember one night I was teaching and there was some Tibetan Lama here who was, I was teaching together and I was, I was going along like I am with you. And he said, oh, I see what you do. I said, oh? He said, yeah. You get them to laugh and then when their mouths are open you can pop the pill of wisdom in. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, here's Tutu again talking about laughter. And he says, um, it's so important to be able to have a sense of humor, no matter how difficult things get. I remember one time we came to a township just outside of Johannesburg where the apartheid forces had provided weapons to one group and they had killed quite a number of people. 
we were having a meeting of bishops close by, and I was part of those leading the funeral of the victims of that massacre. So imagine, here you are, there's been terrible killing in the community. The people were obviously extremely angry, and I didn't know what to do. Yes, I cared about their grief, but then I remembered a story that had been told about how at the beginning of creation God had molded us out of clay and then put us into a kiln like you do with bricks. God put one lot in and then got busy with other things and forgot about those he'd put in, and after a while he remembered and rushed to the kiln where the whole lot was burned to cinders. They, this, they say this is how we black people came about. Everyone laughed a little. And then I said, next, God put in a second lot, and this time he was over-anxious and opened the oven way too quickly. They weren't well-baked, and this second lot came out completely underdone. And that's how white people came about, and you can see it to this day. You know. But what's true in this is that you can always start again. That here they are in the middle of the suffering of the world, and yet the Dharma reminds us that it's possible, that suffering isn't the end of the story, that it's possible to take the suffering that we're granted or given and use it to develop the great heart of compassion. And that becomes the next gift of the Dharma, that compassion and wisdom can be the response to suffering and, com- and conflict. As Abraham Lincoln says, I've always found that mercy bears richer fruits than seeking strict just justice. What a thing to say in the middle of a civil war that cost millions of lives and tore the country apart, where there would be so much cause for bitterness. I have always found that mercy bears richer fruits than seeking strict justice. And you remember a few years ago the terrible thing that happened to the Amish community when a shooter went into a schoolroom in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania and kept ten girls in there and began to shoot them and killed five little girls, shot, shot at others. And the extraordinary thing was that within hours the Amish community forgave the killer and his family. News of the instant forgiveness stunned the world almost as much as the incident itself. Many lauded the Amish, but others worried that hasty forgiveness was emotionally unhealthy. In dozens of interviews with Amish people, this person, the writer says, I discovered something else. Members of the community began offering words and hugs of forgiveness when the blood was barely dry on the schoolhouse floor. A grandmother laughed when I asked if the forgiveness was orchestrated. You mean that some people actually thought we called a meeting to plan forgiveness? As a father of a slain daughter explained, our forgiveness was not our words, it was what we did. Members of the community visited the gunman's widow at her home with food and flowers and hugged members of his family. There were few words but it was primarily their hugs, gifts, and mere presence that were acts of grace that communicated Amish forgiveness. Of the 75 people at the killer's burial, almost half were Amish, including many parents of those who had buried their children just the day before. The Amish people contribute to a fund for the shooter's family. So what is our response to suffering in our own life and in the world around us? Hatred never ceases by hatred, says the Buddha, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law. And so we have forgiveness practice. Many of you have done it, and there's beautiful books on it in the bookstore. We have compassion training, and we have the training to see the noble truths that there is suffering, there are causes to suffering, which is hatred, fear, greed, ignorance, and there's an end to it, which is the opposite, the cultivation of love and courage, of generosity and clarity, and of gratitude.
The roots of suffering are a false sense of separate identity. We're different than them. We have to protect ourselves. The roots of love and wisdom are interdependence. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, woven together in a mutual garment of destiny, says Martin Luther King. To see with the heart, which is the Dharma, we see that it's us together. And there comes then tenderness and compassion. Whatever we value, whatever we celebrate, whatever we enforce in our lives, in our words, in our deeds, and in our politics is what will grow. Here's the Dalai Lama again. What do you do about things that really need attention in this world? He says, if something can be done about the situation, what need is there to be dejected? Let's just do it. And if nothing can be done about it, what use is there to be dejected? Because we can't change it. He said, he went on, people know it in their head, but it doesn't help them. They still worry, said the archbishop. And the Dalai Lama went on, many of us have become refugees. There are a lot of difficulties in my own country. When I look at that, he said, cupping his hands into a small circle, then I worry. I worried about the Tibetan people and all that I care about. But then he widened his hands. But when I look at the world, there are a lot of problems everywhere. Other parts of the People's Republic of China, for example, the Uyghur Muslim community has problems and suffering. And then outside of China, there are many more problems and more suffering and refugees streaming across borders everywhere, refugees like me. When we see these things, we realize that not only do we suffer, but so do many of our human brothers and sisters. And when we look from a wider perspective, we reduce worrying and instead are motivated to tend to the world because it is our brothers and sisters. It shifts from being your personal suffering to becoming the pain of the world. This is part of what you're given, but it's not the end of the story. The person who writes, Zen teacher Durkheim, the person who really being on the way falls upon hard times in the world will not, as a consequence, turn to those friends who offer them refuge and comfort and encourage the old self to survive. Rather, they will seek out someone who will faithfully and inexorably help them to risk themselves so that they may endure the difficulty and pass courageously through it. Only to the extent that a person exposes themselves over and over again to annihilation can that which is indestructible be found within them. And in this daring lies dignity and the spirit of true awakening. So trust, equanimity, a steadiness of heart, a wisdom that sees that suffering is caused by greed and fear and hatred and confusion, ignorance, and that suffering is ended by love and clarity and understanding and generosity. We know how to do this. The development of compassion, especially in conflict, When you're in conflict, the question to ask of the other person in your heart, you don't have to say it out loud, what are your fears? What are your needs? What are your longing? What's behind this? Listen from heart to heart. I mean, you know, in kindergarten, when kids start hitting each other with the blocks, you say, put the block down and use use your words, right? Could we not do that in other parts of the world for larger kids, you know? Could we not do it in Syria? Could we not do it in, you know, I could name 50 countries. Come on, guys, use your words. I did use guys, and I meant to in this case. Sorry to say. Could we not begin to listen to what each other is afraid of? 
because that's what's under a lot of it. And tend one another. Listen deeply. I have a friend who I'm in touch with, just tried to get in touch with him yesterday, um, who's down in Colombia as part of the uh, peace agreement. He's been working there for 25 years as a peacemaker for the signing of the deal between the FARC and the Colombian government to stop the last major war in all of South and North America. And it's really, hallelujah, it's an amazing thing because it's been 50 years. Um, Reconciliation is possible. It is possible, but it requires us to pay attention in a different way, not from our small sense of self and our righteousness and all those things, but to quiet ourselves and say, what really matters? I got this letter from a friend who sits here. My father was not able to communicate his love for his children, even though I found out later that he did love us. He just expressed it in ways that children couldn't necessarily understand. After my mom died, I told my dad I wanted a relationship with him, and we had many good years, but none of my siblings did this. My brother died at 84, excuse me, at 48 of brain cancer. In his last few months, his wife called me and said Jay's one missing thing was that his father had never told him he loved him. I got on the phone and told my dad to say something on his next visit, but according to daddy, the subject never came up. On Jay's last day, his wife, Kathy, called to say Jay would probably die within an hour. At that point, he was blind and paralyzed and hadn't spoken for more than a week. I had Kathy hold the phone to Jay's ear and told him that I loved him. Then I called my father. I said, Daddy, you have one more chance. Jay will probably die today. Pick up the phone and tell him that you love him. And my father did just that. He called Jay. He told him that he loved him. And Jay, who hadn't spoken for more than a week, started talking and talked to Dad for more than an hour. Jay didn't even die that day. He rallied and lived for another month and spent a lot of time during that month talking often, enjoying his new relationship with his father. It's possible. It's possible for us as human beings And it's never too late, and it's never too late to love. So we set the compass of our heart in the best directions that we can. We incline ourselves to what's beautiful. And in this text, the Buddha says, Others may be cruel, we shall not be cruel. Thus we should incline our mind. Others will take what is not given. We will abstain from this. Thus, we should incline our mind. Others will kill living beings. We will protect living beings. Thus, we will incline our mind. Others will speak falsehood. We shall speak truth. Thus, should we incline our mind. Others will be uncaring. We shall be compassionate. Thus, we shall incline our mind. Others will be greedy and envious. We shall not be greedy and envious. Thus, we will incline our mind. We shall be generous. Others will be arrogant. We shall not be arrogant but humble. Thus, we should incline our mind. Others will lack wisdom and compassion we will cultivate wisdom and live with compassion. Thus, we should incline our mind. And it really talks about the possibilities of us as human beings. What intention do we set our heart upon? And what integrity do we most value? Others will slander. Others will cause harm. We will not do so. We will live in a different way. We will live with a nobility and dignity. Thus, we shall incline the mind. Other will be uncaring. We will be compassionate. Now, it doesn't mean when you're compassionate that you therefore have to go out and do everything for everyone. That would be a violence against yourself. For some of you, it will be to raise a mindful and beautiful child 
For some, it will be to create art that redeems the world, that lets people see the wonder of it anew. For some, it will be to run a conscious business. For many, it will be also to be activists and work to heal injustice and to care for those who need their basic life to be valued. Put down the guns, bandage the wounds, carry the water, share the bread. These are all the works that you might do. From a place of stillness, from quieting the mind and opening the heart. And it's never been done before by somebody like you. In the vast universe of a trillion stars, billions of galaxies, there's never been one being exactly like you. It's kind of wild, isn't it? That's the kind of abundance of life itself. I'm going to make a new person that we've never seen, even though we've had billions of them before. Look at this one. Try this one out. And you're one of them, right? It's never been done before. These acquaintances drove up to the botanical garden um, in Montreal, these two, two guys, that was a very special temple garden that had been moved from China to the West and it had the largest bonsai collection outside of Asia. We approached the massive gate and discovered this day that it was locked. I panicked, ready to demand entry after driving 400 miles from another country to see this. My husband, Robert, like an Asian sage, simply treated the situation as a koan, a riddle to be solved. He stood quietly for a time, and then he began to walk the outer wall of the garden, which is high, insurmountable. I was frustrated. He kept slowly walking along the high wall, but the garden stretched for 200 acres or more, and I wondered, are we going to walk its entire perimeter? The thought made me cranky. And he kept walking mindfully and slowly. And suddenly, when we'd walked farther than was originally in our view, the walls disappeared. In fact, the garden itself had no walls, save for the facade at its entrance. We simply walked through the open grass to a path that welcomed us. And what had seemed like an impenetrable barrier, a locked threshold, was a symbolic gate waiting for our patience and our understanding. 